see that? So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the pizza. Pizza and geeks always mix well. I'm just going to get my notes here. Of course, using the absolutely awesome Collab Notes application that Konrad Renner made for Android, um, which by the way works really, really well. If you haven't installed it yet, you should. And you should also give Konrad a hug. Next year he's going to be at the summit. He has a good excuse this time though. Um, since uh, he's actually on his honeymoon right now. So um, I think that counts. It's, it's all right. I mean, I, I, I understand. So uh, thank you very much for being with us over these past two days. Um, as you uh, have seen, there's been a lot of work going on in the background. Um, I mean, also a lot of visible work, but um, a lot of the things that you have seen today actually represent a lot of internal work as well because of the way in which you need to actually operate, the level at which you need to operate in order to be able to deliver consistently toward the customer and actually toward customers who are used to very high level um, standards, right? I mean, the fact that you heard earlier um, that we broke a Microsoft monopoly at a Microsoft Platinum partner in Switzerland, purely on the value of the application, to me was one of the most important validations of what we are doing and how the team is approaching this of the past years, really. I mean, the fact that we can now go into a Microsoft shop that is as deeply connected to Microsoft as any company could ever be and show them Colab and by showing them Colab running on Hyper-V virtualized through free IPA hooked against their native Active Directory and make that work so well that they say, we are convinced that Colab is the best grouper solution in the market. And that's actually a literal quote from an email, which I like very much to get. I mean, that kind of email, right, you, you want to receive. So I think the fact that we can now operate in a way that we get that kind of quote, um, to me shows that a lot of that work that's been going on in the background is not only necessary, but has also been successful. Of course, I mean, there's always more work to be done, but um, from the perspective of what we have achieved now, the sound of power again. Um, from the perspective of what we have actually achieved. I have a guest. Um, I think it is very, very important. Um, it's um, ultimately also translating to a certain level of slowing some things down, right? I mean, in the beginning, when you start out, you're rolling things out as you go along, you make them up as you go along because that's the only way you can roll. You can roll forward that fast. Now that we actually have a product that can actually service this sector of customers and to those expectations, of course, we need to be much more process oriented 
which means that you need to actually do things proper to ensure that the confidence that people put in you is not being disappointed. So whenever we get the question from, you know, people say, oh, how hard can it be, you know, just roll out component X, Y, or Z. It's, I mean, it's understandable on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, you, you realize that it's not that obvious, perhaps, to someone who's never been in a professional environment, how much goes into actually making this happen in a reliable, sustainable, and controlled fashion. So why have we put ourselves up to this task? Why did we choose the putting the freedom back in the cloud as our motto for this year? Why are we on, on a roadshow together with IBM and Red Hat through the Colab Tasters to demonstrate a whole open stack? Now, we live in very, very interesting times. I mean, we've all been following the things with Safe Harbor, with Privacy Shield, right? The, the fact that, I mean, we heard yesterday, there is no 100% legally safe way to use US cloud services today. No one knows the actual liability risk that you're taking when you do that. Most people ignore it and just do it anyway and hope nothing bad will happen. But ultimately, right now, we don't really know. My caffeine ran out. In fact, I mean, we've had Simon Schlauri, who is one of the premier, if not the premier privacy law expert in Switzerland, um, look at this to, uh, to understand what is the situation there. And I mean, it, I, I, I have been working with lawyers in the past, as many of you know, but um, the fact that lawyers also know the term legal simulation for, was for me very, very interesting. For him, also the binding contractual clauses, safe harbor, privacy shield, they're all ultimately legal simulations. So it was an Austrian professor of law that actually said, right now is impossible. Professor Dr. Peter Burgstaller, in fact, from the FH Hardenberg, who said, right now, legal use of WhatsApp in Europe is actually impossible. That legal uncertainty that was introduced ultimately is the result of a lack of security. Um, a lack of security in knowing what happens to your data and knowing, in fact, who has access to your data. Thanks to Snowden, thanks to Max Schrems, these topics have been very, very high on the agenda. Now, I've been thinking a bit about what that means. I've had some personal thoughts on that subject. And ultimately, for me, it boils down that security always requires trust. You cannot live without trust in a world. Um, I mean, we always trust in all sorts of things around us in daily life. Um, because it makes good sense. Um, if we were to assume a zero trust policy, we could not have eaten the pizza for lunch because we would have had to assume that, you know, something may be bad with that. We would have wanted to control the entire process to the production and the delivery, that there was nothing injected into the pizza. You know, all, all these things we would have wanted to assume, to actually check, to verify. Um, only because we assume it's probably okay because we trust in that supply chain. Can we just eat it and feel safe? And that's very reasonable because, it, I mean, imagine you had to check everything all the time. I mean, you would for certain end up in an insane asylum. There is no way you can live in a world without trust. The question is whom to trust? and why to trust? What are your reasons, your rationale for trusting? Ultimately, trust requires understanding, requires the ability to know 
what is behind it. Trust without understanding requires faith. And in fact, it was Pope Francis who in March um, had this uh, uh, morning meditation, I don't understand, but I trust in you. Trust without understanding is in fact in the area of religion. It's part of a religious system. But how much faith do you really put in the church of Microsoft? Is that really your religion? And I mean, I, I've had people who were practically telling me as much. I've met CIOs who told me to the face that being a CIO is a very easy thing and it requires practically no strategic decisions or knowledge. All you have to do, and this is a literal quote, is always buy the latest thing from Microsoft. Now, personally, that left, left me flabbergasted enough that I had nothing left to say, really, so I moved on to the next person. But um, that level of trust really only exists in religion. So trust and understanding go hand in hand, which is why security through obscurity is dead as a concept. It's been dead for a very, very long time. August Kerkhoff, in fact, even proved mathematically that a proprietary system, a system that requires secrecy to function, a system that you need to keep secret for it to be secure, is inherently, by principle, less secure than one that relies on openness. So security is achieved by openness, by transparency, by being able to see what is going on. Trust, but verify, if you will. But it goes even further. For it was Richard Feynman who said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. The ability to take things apart, to put them back together, maybe in a different way, to build upon them, to work with them, in all the creative ways that we can think of, is an essential part of being able to understand, which is why free software, why open source is so important, and why the four freedoms of free software, so to use, to study, to share, and to distribute the software, are so utterly relevant and important in our world. Only then, only if you have those four freedoms, can you truly understand can you truly verify? Can you truly have a, an open, transparent system? Just publishing, dumping millions of lines of source code on somebody does not increase anyone's security, anyone's trust. Or it shouldn't, at least. And of course, every defense is only as good as its weakest link. No attacker has ever done the defender the favor of attacking at the strongest point. They look for the weakness, for the back door in, for the thing that you forgot. They don't just, you know, go head on into the fortress at the strongest point and slam their head against it until they faint. That's not what they do. Which means for us, those principles of openness, of participation, of understanding, need to actually permeate the entire stack of what we're running. Now, the free software movement started out at the operating system level, right? I mean, that's where we started. We started by creating a free software operating system in, in the beginning using proprietary tools because there were none other available. I mean, we just had no choice. So we started to build an operating system. We built tool chains, we built applications, and freedom has moved up the stack a lot. And in fact, it has spread very, very far. I mean, most of the internet is running on free software. Google, Facebook would not be possible without free software. They would not exist. So to that extent, of course, it's already been a tremendous success. But what we have ignored 
so far, also for lack of better alternatives, is the hardware side, right? Um, we are all still running Intel, for the most part, except on the you know energy critical devices where ARM is of course the standard um, and the most efficient solution that we have. And ARM has a much much better policy than Intel, so it's a much more trustworthy partner for us. But for the most part. The cloud, the internet, the world runs on Intel right now, which means it runs on an infrastructure that is in a single proprietary hand, and it's a very proprietary one at that, with a strong monopolistic approach to things, with technology that is so complex that we barely understand it. I mean, the fact that there is you know, CPUs in the CPU that can actually override anything that happens on that machine, the fact that there are secret opcodes that you know, Intel shares with certain you know, companies that use their chips, that e exhibit you know, spe specific ways of the CPU to that company and that company alone, but they build them into every chip, right? Because you wouldn't set up a complete fab only for like one customer. So you know that you have some secret, you know, Google code, some secret Facebook code in your Intel chipset. You have no idea what it does. So we need something better. And when you look at how much work it is to set up a complete hardware ecosystem, how much R&D goes into hardware research, what the process is to create a single chip, it becomes pretty clear pretty fast that it is not really an option for us to just do that from scratch, you know, by just like, oh, let's build something, you know, new to replace it all. That is a very, very, very steep curve. It's one that, you know, requires more invest than possibly any single party on this planet could muster right now. So what other alternatives are there? Well, one is power. Um, it is the work that IBM's been doing on the power chipset, which you know, ultimately comes from a you know, different architecture of processors that they've been working on for a long, long time. And I myself, I mean, having started out with assembler on the Z80, having moved to the 68K, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, I admit. I, I know which of these two platforms is a lot better to develop assembler code on. And it's not the Z80. And consequently, not the Z80 on steroids, so it's the 386 and so on family. So, IBM. Well, IBM is not, all, all, it's not really a company that has no history with monopoly abuse. Um, in fact, they invented a lot of the dirty games that Microsoft's been playing for a long time. But they have also found themselves in need of change, in need of actual evolution. Also, in part, because it was simply forced upon them. I mean, they had to realize that their old approach was no longer working. They were losing business and fast. So they had to understand what would they have to do in order to still have a role in the future and not fare the same fate as, say, Sun. What they have done, and I only understood this a little bit later, um, is rather interesting because they have given away their entire Intel dependency. They first gave away Lenovo, to Lenovo their laptops, right? I mean, the world already found that strange. But last year, they also gave to Lenovo the entire server side. And if you look at servers and you know, real data center hardware, the uh, flex systems that they have developed, when, at the time when they gave them away, they were still pretty new. I mean, they were just a few years in the market, um, and they were actually ahead of quite a few other companies. I mean, you look at the actual technical properties of those systems, they were pretty damn sweet. So they could have milked it for a while longer, but they didn't. They gave all the flex side on the server to Lenovo. Which is interesting, because what I only also realized later is that meant they gave away their entire dependency on Intel. 
they are now free from Intel and they can do whatever they please without needing to actually pay any respect to Intel. Not even all the Linux distributions are in the same position. They're actually more free than some of our Linux distros in that regard. What they instead have done is they have put the entire chip design, everything about the way they develop power, into a foundation, which is called the Open Power Foundation, where everyone can join. It's a free membership association. Everyone can go in there. You can learn how power works. You can build your own chips if you want. In fact, the Chinese have elected to do that. They disable parts of the power chip that they don't trust in the fab because they think that maybe the NSA has strong-armed IBM into putting something in there that they may not like. And they think they can do it in other places in their um, machines that they're going to build. So they disabled that. And they can. Because it's an open design for those that participate. And I mean, Google, Facebook, and so on, they actually all participate because all of them feel the Intel dependency. So Rackspace and Google together have actually announced their next generation data center machine to be based on Power9. Because Power is actually not just the only such technology that is open, it is also one that is extremely well suited for the cloud. It is very good with heavy compute. It is very, very good with you know, parallel computation. It can run parallel things incredibly efficiently. So it's not just open, it's actually also better. And that is something when I realized it, I also realized practically no one had ever heard about this in our community. It was really a surprise. When I was asking some friends what they thought about the open power story, they were like, which story? Like, what is open power? Like, what does it do? Um, so it's actually been unknown. At the same time, I think by the fact that we've ignored it so far and not paid attention to it, we're also giving away a pretty good chance. Because for me, the open power story has all these aspects of what I call by now the Tesla moment. For me, the Tesla moment is defined by doing the better thing with the right values. You see, before Tesla, all electric cars were very clearly built by people who hate cars for people who hate cars. Driving them should not be fun because you should not drive a car. It should be a penance. You should, you know, somehow suffer for driving a car, which you should not do. That was the underlying design principle of electric cars before Tesla. I mean, look at the cars that even the major manufacturers put out today as electric cars. A lot of them are like dinky toys in comparison to their mainline models. To make it really clear that this is not the kind of car you want. Tesla turned that around, right? They built cars where they said, we're going to build the best car ever. That's our goal. And it's going to be 100% electric because that is what this planet needs. We need to move to electric mobility. The only way we ever get that adoption rate is by actually building something that people want. It's by building something that is better and has the right values. And I believe for us as a community, it would be wise to adopt the same principle. In fact, it's a design principle that we at Colab also follow. We try to build to the same standard of let's make it better and the right thing. That is why I, in the beginning, started to work with Colab, because I saw that potential there. That is why Aaron also got involved. I remember before he came on board, our long conversations about that subject. And now, with the open power story, we actually have the chance of doing open hardware, open firmware, open software, and open standards to tie it all together, to have a complete stack that is open, free, and trustworthy. 
And that is why we've done the Colab Tastery events, because there we can present a completely fully open stack. That's why we have that noisy power box um, segregated into the hallway right now, because otherwise it, it'd be a bit annoying. But why we have that power box with us, running Colab, in this case on Red Hat, but it might as well just be Zuse, because Zuse also works really, really well with power. And Zuse and Red Hat are both completely free and, and enterprise-level applications. Because openness alone, as Tesla also showed, doing the right thing alone is not enough. People will not buy it if it's crap just because it's open. That approach cannot work. It needs to be better as well. It needs to be professional. It needs the enterprise support. It needs the actual ability to run this in five, for five, 10 years, 15 years in production. I mean, look how many old systems are still there. People need the assurance they can run that with the things we built. So in fact, both Zuse and Red Hat have played a very, very important role in bringing about an understanding of professional attitude into our ecosystem. In fact, Richard just was here and we had a quick chat about the fact that that's exactly what he was trying to talk about today. We need to understand the professional side is not an afterthought. It's an urgent necessity if we want to reach our goals. And it reflects, in the best case, not just the technology we built and the way we approach it, but also the way our organizations are structured. If you haven't seen it yet, the book, The Open Organization, by Red Hat CEO, is actually really interesting. Because if you don't know his CV, I mean, Jim Whitehurst's background was very, very classical, right? As classic industry as you can possibly ever get. I mean, he was the chief operating officer of Delta Airlines when they were about to crumble. I mean, they were practically dead in the water. And he turned them around with really, really classic management methodology and hard cuts and, you know, people had to suffer through all sorts of things to make it happen. You know, the people at Delta came together to do it. I mean, without the support of the company, he could never have done it. But he did it in a very classical management guy way. He's a man classical management guy. If he now publishes a book that says the free software approach of management, the decentralized approach of running our projects, can also run companies and can run, can, can run companies that are large with massive volumes and can run them better than the traditional approach. When he says that, that he's come around to understanding this approach is actually better than the traditional management approach, to me that's very meaningful, to be honest. I, 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 to me that's one of the primary values in that book. And Colab, of course, comes from the same kind of community as that book. We embody very much the same values and approaches. And in fact, I was always a little bit worried whether we would have to give that up at some point in order to be, become larger, because we need to be bigger to achieve everything we want to achieve. And having read this book now, I'm, I'm kind of glad because, it, you know, have someone else tell you that, no, actually, that approach is better and you can run very large organizations with it, so don't worry. I mean, it scales to any size that you need it to scale to. That's a good thing. I mean, I, I think it's actually wonderful. Because Colab is based on this 12-year track record, starting from the German Federal Agency for IT, IT Security, the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnologie, which initially commissioned its development 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. Of course, we do, as you know, the full enterprise collaboration on desktop, mobile, web. You've heard about the fact that we're going to do with Collabora the full you know, office editing in the web. Um, so keep your eyes you know, open for that. That's going to happen pretty time soon. Real-time collaboration is high on, on our agenda of things we, we are looking at. Aaron shared some of our thoughts on where that technologically needs to go in order to be sustainable and scalable um, yesterday. And of course, we're thinking all along the areas of social knowledge and relationships data leak prevention, just to name a few things that 
are very high on the list of things we are in fact considering. Because I mean, ultimately, doesn't say it here, but our mission is to put confidence back into collaboration, right? We want people, society, everyone on this planet to be able to collaborate in confidence. And that is a mission that has a pretty long horizon. I mean, and it requires partnerships. It requires working together, which is why we are very glad for the second time to host the Collab Summit with the OpenSUSE community, because it's one of the communities that we really like to engage with. It's why we're doing this roadshow together with IBM and Red Hat. And it's why I am happy to announce Collab Systems has in fact now also joined the Open Power Foundation. We have become a full member of the Open Power Foundation because we want to be part of the community that can actually drive change and openness, not just up, but also down the stack. We want to be able to be part of that story. Collab already runs on power. That's not the big problem. Of course, we can always fine tune it and improve it. And I'm sure we're going to do that as part of this collaboration. But for me personally, it's, it's part of a larger story. The Open Power Foundation is a foundation that is shaped by its members. We get to shape it along with everyone else. And I think as a community, we should engage with these kind of efforts more. Because I don't see where else we are going to get that level of openness, that level of freedom in terms of hardware, and what is our next best contender for that. I, do, I mean, I don't expect Intel to change anytime real soon, and if they do, it's probably going to be because open power has become an actual threat. Until it has, I don't expect them to change their business model at all. So we need to make sure open power does become that threat to them, because then we may be able to actually force them to open up as well. But that's really how this has to work. So we want that open, secure hardware under user control, where people can build their own boxes, where you can build a pre-created box, you know, just an appliance of call up on power, all these things we want to do. Because to us, it has the same hallmark elements, the same critical elements of doing the better thing that is also the right thing. It's the more efficient hardware. You can run many more users with much less electricity in a much better way. But it's also the right thing. Which is why a lot of the things you've also seen here about how we're building better technology, or at least believe we do, how we've set up our partner program, how we've structured ourselves to be able to deliver commercial support at the highest and most professional levels. That is where it all comes together. That is why we're doing this, because we need to be able to do this well in order to be able to scale, in order to be able to actually get that openness up and down the stack. So we, in fact, because this is, this is a shared story, right? This is an ecosystem story. This is a working together story in order to make things happen. And so for everyone who chooses to be part of that story by contributing to Cola, by using Cola, by working with us in some form, by spreading the word about Cola, by joining the conferences, by in any way being part of that ecosystem in which we also live. Anyone who chooses that, chooses to be part of that story. So I hope that more people will in fact choose to be part of that story in the future. Because I believe it matters and I believe it is the way in which we can actually bring about lasting change. And that's why all the work has gone into all the aspects you've seen here at the summit. And I hope that next year, when we do the next summit, we will be able to show you a whole lot more, as well as, you know, run through whatever fantastic features Cube will then have, you know. Um, I'm really, really excited about Cube. You have no idea how much I look forward to it. Being beta tester number one for our contact client, I, uh, I very much look forward to this. So, 
please be part of that story, develop it with us, and in fact, engage with us. Because engagement, constructive, positive, maybe also sometimes critical, is a part of being part of this community. And I hope that I will see all of you again at the Call Up Summit next year. Thank you very much. All right, I think the program says we're gonna do this interactive now anyway.